Welcome to Divine Deliberations. My name is David Fincher, and today we're going to be addressing a topic that rarely gets addressed from the pulpits and the content creators on YouTube, rarely ever. And that's the Lordship of Christ and what that really, really means. So we're glad you joined us. Stay tuned. We're going to tackle that topic today on Divine Deliberations. Before we get into the message today, let me remind you to hit the subscribe button, the like button, the share button, and turn on notifications. That way you're notified every time we put out a new video, and it really would help the channel. So we would appreciate it. Hit the subscribe button right there. You can do it. Okay, good. All right, today, here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to jump on a topic that a lot of people basically just sort of ignore these days, especially from the pulpits. I mean, the message from the pulpits has become a softer message, a shorter message, uh, a message that tends to carry with it less dynamic than what Christ preached and the apostles preached in the first century. The message has become vague. It's not about absolutes anymore. It's no longer book, chapter, and verse, but rather emotions and how I feel. And some people say, well, that's all relative. It's whatever you think it is. This is just your interpretation. And the authority of scriptures has been pushed aside by the traditions, doctrines, dogmas, emotions, and the denominations of men. I mean, let me tell you what's happened here. We, we've ended up with what I would call a believism. Just believe. That's all you have to do. Accept Jesus into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior, and, and you're good. Many people today, they want Jesus as Savior, but they're not willing to have him as Lord. But in Acts, the second chapter, in verse 36, when Peter preached that first gospel sermon in the name of a risen Redeemer, he said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That's important that we understand that. God did not make Jesus just Savior. He made him both Lord and Christ. Now, let me pre-qualify this a little bit. Jesus asked a rhetorical question. In Luke, the sixth chapter, in verse 46, he said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You see, the implications of that rhetorical question are actually staggering. In other words, Jesus, he, he wasn't looking for an answer. He didn't want anyone to give him an excuse as to why they call him Lord, but then don't do what he says. The answer is implied in the question. In other words, it will do you no good. It's a waste of time to call me Lord, but not do what I say. In John, the 14th chapter, in verse 15, Jesus makes this statement. If you love me, keep my commandments. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. I don't know if you got that, but Jesus is saying, you can call me Lord, Lord all day long, and that's not going to guarantee your place in heaven. Here's what's going to guarantee your place in heaven. Doing the will of my Father, which is in heaven. We all need a Savior. There's no doubt about that. And Jesus wants to be that Savior. But in order to have him as Savior, we must also accept and submit to his Lordship. I mean, if you will not have him as Lord, 
then you cannot have him as Savior. Again, Acts 2.36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know surely God had made him this same Jesus whom you crucified, both, both Lord and Christ. So the first thing that we need to examine here is the emphasis of lordship within the pages of the New Testament. That's important. I mean, if the emphasis is on lordship, then that demands our attention and our submission to that teaching. The word savior comes from the Greek word soter. It means savior, deliverer, preserver. The word lord, according to Thayer's, it comes from the Greek word kurios. It means he to whom a person or a thing belongs, about which he has power of deciding, master, lord, the possessor or disposer of a thing, the owner, one who has control of the person, the master, in the state, the sovereign, prince, chief, emperor. It is also a title of honor, expressive of respect and reverence with which servants greet their masters. This title was given to God and the Messiah. Now, I want you to think about this. The word Savior means deliverer. The word Lord means owner or master. Now, the emphasis in the New Testament, let me tell you, the word Savior appears 24 times within the pages of the New Testament. Eight times to refer to God the Father as Savior, and the remaining 16 times to refer to Christ the Son as Savior. The word Lord appears 728 times in the New Testament. The combinations of the word Lord Jesus appears 116 times, Lord Jesus Christ 82 times. In the book of Acts, our Lord is called Savior only twice. Only twice. Acts 5 and verse 31, Him God hath exalted to His right hand to be Prince and Savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Acts 13 and verse 23 is the other place. From this man's seed, speaking of David, according to the promise God raised up for Israel, a Savior, Jesus. So within the pages of the book of Acts, Christ is called Savior only twice. But if you examine that beautiful historical book regarding the development, the start and the development of the church, you'll see where Christ is referred to as Lord 92 times. He is called Lord Jesus 20 times, Lord Jesus Christ six times. I mean, do the math here. Savior, 24 times. That word is used in the New Testament. But the word Lord is used 728 times. Now, don't misunderstand me. We are in a dire need for Savior. Romans 3 and verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 5 and verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 and verse 19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom... I am chief. So though the word Savior may not appear in the text as often as the word Lord, the atoning and saving work of Christ is the major theme of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. So I'm not negating or minimizing the sacrificial and saving work of Jesus on the cross in any way, all right? But we cannot miss the Lordship of of Christ. God hath made this same Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. You see this isn't about coffee or tea, all right? It's not about choosing one or the other. It's about recognizing him as both Lord and Savior. Peter Forsyth said the first duty of every soul is to find not its freedom but its master. Augustine said, Jesus Christ is not valued at all until he is valued above all. You see, we need to get it. Jesus is Lord 
First Timothy 6 and verse 15, Jesus Christ, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 19 and verse 16, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. The New Testament emphasizes the lordship of Christ, and you can't play games with that, and you can't play games with God. Let me tell you, that's a huge mistake. God hath made him both Lord and Christ, and you can't play games with that. Galatians 6, 7, and 8 says, be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let me tell you something, if Jesus was who he said he was, and he is the second person of the Godhead, he himself is God, and you will meet him face to face. The question is, is he your Lord, your master? Are you submitting to his lordship? So we see the emphasis of lordship within the pages of the New Testament. We also need to receive the education of lordship. He is the savior of all men. Paul actually said that God is the savior of all men. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 10, For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the savior of all men, especially of those who believe. John said, Jesus is the Savior of all men. In 1 John, the second chapter, verse 1 and verse 2, he said, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So both John and Paul are saying that God is the Savior of all men. Christ is the Savior of the whole world. But yet not all men will be saved. The Bible makes it clear in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that find it. So we need to get this. He is the Savior of all men, but not all men will be saved. So how do we reconcile that seemingly contradiction? I mean, we really have to come down to a few choices here. Either universalism is true, Paul and John got it wrong, Paul and John got it right, and Jesus got it wrong, or all of those are wrong. Well, I'll opt for the last one. There's another option, and it's sufficient versus efficacious. You see, the word efficacious means capable of having the desired result or effect. Effective as a means, measure, remedy. The medicine is efficacious in stopping a cough. So as you look at the, the definition of that word and the illustration used in the definition of that word, the medicine is efficacious in stopping a cough. But here's the thing. The medicine has to be taken in order for it to be effective. And that's where we get to the part where it actually works where all men could be saved. But because not all men come to Christ, not all men take the medicine, not all men are saved. Let's pretend you tell me, you, you put in the comment section below your, your total bills that you owe, and I write you a check for the sum of that total and put that check into your hand, and then you turn around and put that check in your back pocket and you leave it there. You never cash it. Then the check is sufficient, but it's not efficacious. So we need to understand that. The, the cross is sufficient for the salvation of all men, for all time, all sins that have ever been committed. The cross is sufficient to deal with those sins. So those sins are, in essence, paid for by the death of Christ on the cross. But because not all men come to Christ, those sins remain on the individuals who refuse to. And because not all men accept the finished work of Christ at Calvary's cross, his work is not efficacious. All men have the check, but not all men 
have or will cash the check. Now, I said all that to say this. Jesus is Savior, but Jesus is also Lord. Now, I used to say in my younger days as a preacher, you need to make Jesus Lord of your life. And those are the wrong words. I was using the wrong words to make that statement because you don't make Jesus Lord. God has already made him Lord. What you need to do and what I need to do is recognize, accept, and submit to his lordship. God has made Jesus Lord. Philippians, the second chapter, verses 8 through 11 says, Wherefore God hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, of things in the earth, and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God has already made Christ Lord. The question is for you and me, is do we recognize his lordship? Let me tell you something. Everyone will bow the knee to Christ as Lord and Master. Everyone. As surely as Jesus is Savior of all men, he is Lord of all. The problem is, is not all men recognize his lordship. Not all men submit to his lordship. In Acts the 10th chapter, verses 34 through 36, the Bible says, as Peter spoke to the family of Cornelius, those first Gentiles being brought into the church, then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Did you see that? He is Lord of all. Not should be Lord of all, not could be Lord of all, not ought to be Lord of all. He is Lord of all. It is Jesus that will command the resurrection of the dead. John the fifth chapter, verses 26 through 29, for as the Father hath life in himself, so he hath given to the Son to have life in himself and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. It is Jesus before whom you and I will one day stand. Matthew 25, 31 through 33 says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all his holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. When Jesus looked down the corridor of time at that event that will take place at the end of time, he pictured that massive crowd of all humanity, of all time, everyone who's ever lived will be at that judgment day. Guess what he saw? As he looked down the corridor of time at that mass and that crowd of humans from Adam all the way to the last soul conceived, guess who he saw in the crowd? He saw you in the crowd. He saw me in that crowd because we're going to be there. But the question is for you and for me, which side, which side did he see you parted to? And that's probably one of the most important questions that you can answer. Did he see you parted to the right? Or did he see you parted to the left? I am convinced that depends on whether you and I submit ourself to his lordship. Jesus is Lord now, not just then. You and I need to understand something. We cannot have him as savior if we are not willing to accept him and submit to his lordship because he is Lord of all. We have to submit to his lordship. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? So we must understand the emphasis of lordship that's placed within the pages of the New Testament and the education of lordship that he must be recognized as Lord of all and then we must submit 
to his lordship. And then let me tell you what happens when that happens, the effect of lordship. The effect of lordship is going to be a changed life. Lordship, I believe, is what empowered the Christians of the first century. As the crushing stones pounded the life from his body, Stephen, the first of many martyrs, actually said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, Acts 7 and verse 59. So from Stephen to James to all the martyrs down through the centuries, lordship changed lives. Paul claimed exactly that in Philippians, the third chapter, four through eight. He says, but what things were gained to me, these things I counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Now, I don't know where I read this, but I believe it to be true. Someone once said, I contend that if a Christian has settled the lordship issue, then all other issues of his life are also settled. When Jesus is Lord of a person's life, he will fulfill his duties, obligations, and responsibilities with joy. Again, I don't know who said it, but I believe that's exactly true. Jesus called us to take up a cross, and he meant no words concerning that cross. In Luke, the ninth chapter, 23 through 26, he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man shall be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. You see, recognizing Christ as Lord means going to a cross. The message ringing out from pulpits today, let me tell you, it's a softer message of prosperity and wealth and pleasure and, and even politics. And I guess, I guess that's acceptable to today's society of Christians, but I don't see it at all within the pages of the New Testament, and especially within the pages of Acts. I see people who worship the Lord in threat of death on a daily basis, but they denied themselves and followed him, and it didn't matter what it cost them. I've heard people say, I guess that's just my cross to bear. Now, I get the sentiment, all right, but it misses the meaning of Jesus' words. The cross in the first century meant one thing, and it meant one thing only, death. It wasn't sickness. It wasn't financial difficulty. It wasn't trouble with relationships. It meant death, period. And going to a cross, most people today listen to that kind of message from a pulpit or from an episode like this, and they say that's an outdated message. That's old-fashioned. That's old school. Now, let me tell you what it is. It's Jesus. Jesus is the one that said, take up your cross daily. Tozer made this statement. The new cross does not slay the sinner. It redirects him. It gears him to a cleaner and jollier way of living and saves his self-respect. The Christian message is slanted in the direction of the current vogue in order to make it acceptable to the public. The philosophy back of this kind of thing may be sincere, but its sincerity does not save it from being false. It is false because it is blind. It misses completely the whole meaning of the cross. The old cross is a symbol of death. It stands for the abrupt, violent end of a human being. The man in Roman times who took the cross and started down the road has already said goodbye to his friends. He was not coming back. He was not going out to have his life redirected. He was going out to have it ended. The cross made no compromise, modified nothing, spared nothing. It slew all of the man completely and for good. It did not try to keep on good terms with the victim. It struck cruel and hard, and when it had finished its work, the man was no more. 
Tozer says that people who are crucified with Christ have three distinct marks. They are facing only one direction. They can never turn back and they no longer have plans of their own. The effect of lordship, let me tell you, it is a changed life, it is a crucified life, and finally, it is a committed life. Lordship means a committed life. The apostles were committed to the Lord Jesus. Most of them, if not all of them, had never seen the inside of a college or a university. But yet they took the gospel to all the creation within 30 to 40 years after the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. You can read that in Colossians 1 and verse 23. And they did that, took that message to the civilized world. They did that without the benefit of radio, TV, newspapers, airlines, automobiles, railroads, steamships, and the internet. You say, well... They had the ability to work miracles. I submit to you that their miraculous power without commitment to the Lord would not have done what they did. The miracles they performed did not ease their pain and their suffering, their blood, sweat, and tears. It was commitment. It was commitment to the Lord. I'm also convinced that if you and I were to have the same dedication to the Lord that they had then, if we had that dedication now that they had then, we could do today what they did then. And if not, why not? They all died martyrs for Jesus as their Lord. According to tradition, Matthew suffered martyrdom by being slain with a sword in Ethiopia. John was put in a cauldron of boiling oil, but escaped death in a miraculous manner and was afterwards banished to Patmos. Peter was crucified at Rome with his head downward at his own request, saying he was not worthy to suffer in the same way that his Lord did. James the Greater was beheaded at Jerusalem. James the Less was thrown from the lofty pinnacle of the temple. And then when he didn't die, they beat him to death with fuller's clubs. Bartholomew was filleted alive. Andrew was bound to a cross, and he preached to his persecutors until he died. I believe it was three days it took him to die on that cross. Thomas was run through the body with a lance, and Jude was shot to death with arrows, and Philip was crucified. Matthias was stoned, and then when that didn't kill him, they beheaded him. And Paul, after various tortures and persecutions, numerous ones actually, at length, he was beheaded at Rome. Why? Why? Because Jesus was their Lord. John Wesley once said, Give me 300 men who fear nothing but God, hate nothing but sin, and know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and I'll set the world on fire. Wesley was right. This lesson has been about the Lordship of Jesus. Someone may say, Well, it sounds like a work salvation. I've not been talking about works. I've been talking about lordship. I've been talking about making him master of your life and my life. You see, the issue of my life is who is going to run it, David or the son of David. And that's also the issue of your life. Who's going to run it? And it's about choosing, allowing him to be lord and master of your life. Because if you will have him as Lord and master of your life, salvation as Savior, he comes in and there's no doubt about salvation. But if you're trying to have him as Savior without taking him as Lord, it isn't going to work. God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. Matthew 25, verse 23 says, His Lord said unto him, Well done, Thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I think one of the most wonderful things about Christianity is as we finish this life, serving him as our Lord and master, to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's what it's all about. The Lordship of Christ. And it's not about earning salvation. He's Lord. He's Savior. But we come to him 
because of what he accomplished at Calvary. We can be saved, but don't kid yourself that if you think you can just have him as Savior and reject his lordship over your life, it doesn't work. It will not happen. He must be the Lord and master of your life. You must recognize his lordship and submit to his lordship, and then you'll have him as Savior. Once again, thanks for joining us. I hope this lesson's been of benefit to you. If you have any comments, please make them in the comments section below. We're more than happy to answer Bible questions with Bible answers, but we're glad you're here. We pray that you'll have a wonderful week. Before you go, though, make sure that you hit the subscribe button and the like button and the share button and turn on notifications. That way you're notified every time we put out a new video. Jesus is Lord. One day you and I will meet him face to face. I hope at the end of a life that has recognized and submitted to his Lordship. And then you'll hear those words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Thanks for being here. Be safe in the coming week. God bless you. See you again next week.